listening to Consulting Logistics, presented by A. Born and Company. I'm your host, Tim Dooner. Thank you for joining us. Today, I'm chatting with Sarah Barnes Humphrey, our voice of reason north of the border. She hosts the Let's Talk Supply Chain podcast, is an entrepreneur, inventor, and investor. We're going to wrap about the year in trade from the Canadian perspective. Let's find out how they really feel about us. <laughs> if you're looking for this episode or any of our previous shows, please visit abornandco.com slash podcast or simply search your favorite podcast player for consulting logistics. And while you're over at abornandco.com, wander around a bit. We have plenty of great and informative articles on there covering all aspects of logistics as well as information on some of our goods and services. I think that's Sarah now. Let's get her on the air. Sarah, how are you this afternoon? I am doing great, Tim. How are you? Thanks so much for having me on the show today. You're welcome, but you know, I almost feel like I should apologize. You're up in the, the great white north of Canada, and I'm down here in the United States, and it's been a contentious year between, you know, our two countries, and mine might have a little bit to do with that, so I apologize, and I will not be rude to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to know. Thanks for letting me know. Yeah, well, relations, they haven't been the bee's knees, and it's sort of like herding cats, trying to get all this trade stuff together lately, but I think we can work through it, and, you know, we've had, speaking of relationships, we have had a little bit of of history before you and I were doing podcasts under different titles a few years ago. So in some ways, I kind of consider you like my sister's show to the north, a friendly voice on the other line. I love it. I love it. I think the exact same thing. And honestly, you know my motto, collaboration is the future of business. And I'm so glad that you and I, you know, got connected. We've been on each other's shows before, and I'm just glad to be back. So thank you again for having me. Yeah, and you know, there's not a ton of podcasts in the logistics space, and the more and better ones there are, the better it is for all of us. So I think it's great to see other shows supporting each other. Absolutely. And we all have, you know, different different shows. We all bring a different value to the community. And so I think that's really important. Different views, different companies, different innovations, different things that shippers and service providers and everybody that's part of that community can really, really learn from. Absolutely. But let me ask, because last time I talked to you, like I mentioned, you were doing, you were doing, well, sort of the similar show. You've changed the format a bit. You've changed the name, but that's where you got your podcasting feet wet. But at the time, you were also the longtime sales and marketing manager for Ice Corp. That's where a lot of your background is you know, rooted in. What's gone on since then? Since we've last spoke, when was that? July of last year? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I spent most of my career at a private 3PL, like you said, uh, Ice Corp. And I started the podcast sort of as a marketing experiment within that. Um, and I had a co-host at the time. And, you know, some things just changed in the fall. And I did keep it going for a little bit at the beginning of this year under the last name, which was Two Babes Talk Supply Chain. And then I just felt with a lot of the movements that were happening in January, it just didn't resonate with too many people. And I also wanted to start a woman in supply chain series. I wanted to feature women that are doing amazing things in the community on the show. And that was my way of sort of giving back to the community as well. And in order for me to do that, I felt like a rebranding was, you know, something I needed to do. So I believe it was in April. I did a total rebrand in one week, which I would not suggest for anybody because it is a lot, a lot of work. But ever since then, the show has really taken off. Everybody is starting to resonate a lot more with it. You know, it's something that I'm, I'm pretty much doing full time now, so... Sarah, I also noticed that when I had to send you the information about coming on the show, you had a brand new email address. And being the investigative reporter that I am, I went to ships.com to see what it was all about, said coming soon. So it looks like you're moving in another direction as well. Yeah, I have taken on an exciting new project. It's an online platform. Because it's a competitive space, we're not really releasing too much information just yet. 
but we are encouraging people to sign up at ships.com because those are the people that are going to be the first ones to know when we are ready to release what we're working on. But very, very exciting things are happening all within the supply chain space for me. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I can't wait to be able to share it with everybody. So. Wow. So keep an eye on ships.com. Something will be coming on that end in the future. But Sarah, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because we both love this industry. And this year in particular has been crazy, right? What a year in supply chain. For better or worse, you know, trade has gone mainstream. And when the mainstream press isn't talking about NAFTA, they're talking about the trade war and another $260 billion in tariffs from just a few days ago. We're seeing new tech develop all around us, and it really feels like this industry is on the cusp of an evolution, or maybe even a revolution. What's the general feeling in Canada, though, about all of this? How's the year been for you? How's your media focused on it? Give me the barometer. So I think it's a little bit of both, a revolution and an evolution. I mean, nobody really can quite put or get their heads around what's going on. Um, I just had a company on the show a little while ago. They said the knowledge base is changing every 1.5 years. And since we can't keep up with change, everybody's sort of okay with mediocre, which is very, very, very scary. Going back to sort of the Canadian perspective, we're just sort of looking at what's going on. Obviously, paying attention to what Trump is doing on your side with the tariffs, taking a close look at NAFTA, And a lot of Canadian businesses are really being forced to diversify. So a while ago, I can't remember the exact stats on this, but at one point we were 90% trade with the U.S. And then a few years ago, we were at 60%. And now with all of these talks and things changing, you know, companies are really taking a look at other markets to purchase from, to import from. And then they're also looking at a lot of other markets to export to as well. We've got a lot of really great trade agreements um, with a lot of different countries. And so people are taking the time to take a look at what that means for them, what that means for their business, and how they're going to be able to mitigate that risk that's happening right now between Canada and the U.S. because we it's the future just looks so uncertain at the moment until they get those talks, you know, sort of finalized and figure out where Canada stands in all of that. You know, it really is uncertain. What do people there seem to make of, I guess, the leadership on your end and in terms of Trump? I know Trump's a very polarizing figure. I'm not sure because I'm not in Canada if Trudeau is polarizing, if people there like him or not, how they feel he's handling the trade war. I can't imagine them really seeing it as his fault, right? He was just kind of hanging out, being cool up in Canada. And uh, I don't know, this year Trump just decided to just shake the rug out everywhere. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of very mixed feelings, I think. And, you know, us Canadians, we're very, very polite. Hope you enjoyed my yard. Have a good day. And so I think we're just sort of, I wouldn't say we're sitting back and sort of waiting and watching. I think we are definitely waiting and watching to see what happens. But in the background, companies are really taking the bull by the horns and, you know, figuring out their future with or without the trade to the U.S. Yeah, and it gets a little scary. And I imagine, especially on the economic side, because when you talk about Canada, there's all sorts of trade going on with with lumber and there is issues going on with the steel as well. But even beyond that, when you talk just uh, from like the personal relationship side and just the, I don't know, the demeanor and the way that our countries have been, or mostly the United States has been treating Canada, you just hope that that doesn't have long lasting repercussions that even go beyond trade agreements or business, right? Yeah, I mean, if you take a look at the way that he's handling a lot of things, though, I mean, it's not just us, really, at the end of the day, right? Um, he is coming down on us quite, quite hard. And I'm not going to get too much into politics, uh, because I have some views of my own that people may or may not agree with. But I think that hopefully the people that we have sent to talk about the NAFTA are really going to, I mean, okay, let's face it, right? So de minimis is totally unfair right now. Do you know what de minimis is? I am not familiar. That's why I have you on. What is de minimis? So basically, if a Canadian were to ship product into the US and it was under $800 in value, there are no taxes or duties or anything applicable. I mean, under NAFTA, it's not really applicable anyways, but it's $800. Into Canada, it's $20. So a little disparity there. So there's a huge discrepancy there. 
I don't think that that is great for obviously our economies working together because it really looks like we're getting a break shipping into the US and we're not giving you guys a break shipping into Canada. And to me, you know, I, I think that that definitely needs to be negotiated. It's obviously a topic on the table. And the other perspective is, I mean, the US shipping into Canada, you're paying a GST, you're paying a 5% tax. You guys don't have that tax. You talk about that Canadian politeness, and I love your perspective on that. You're like, well, it's hard to get mad at him because that's just the way he is. And he's like that to everybody. It reminds me of the way, I don't know, like a bad uncle is introduced at a at Thanksgiving <laughs> or something. <laughs> or for you guys, what is it? for you guys, what do you have? Uh, you don't do Boxing Day or is, that, is Boxing Day near Christmas? Yeah, yeah. Boxing Day is the day after Christmas. It's when we get, it's like our Black Friday. Yeah. Yeah, but you have Canadian Thanksgiving though, right? Yes, Canadian Thanksgiving is the weekend of the 5th of October. So we have it a lot sooner than you guys do. Uh Aha, so that's nearing up. It's barely cold. You do get... (laughs) (laughs) Is it cold there already? It's just started to like a little bit of fall has just started to move in here. But we also are getting the rain from that hurricane that just went through or the tropical storm Florence. So the leaves are changing. I thought it was supposed to be 30 degrees today, but it's actually a lot cooler, um, but still not too, too bad. It's still about, I think we're going to be about 20 degrees from here on out. Are you kidding me? Wait, how? you're in Toronto, right? Yeah, just outside of Toronto, yeah. That's not, it doesn't get that cold that quick in Toronto. <laughs> oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> we have a long, long winter. <laughs> oh, wait a second. Are you talking in Celsius? Yes, of course. Okay. I well, I have an American audience. We're like, I'm like, it's going to be 20 degrees already. I'm talking <laughs> sorry, in Fahrenheit. Sorry, sorry. I forgot who I was talking to. <laughs> Quick, Matt, what is 20 degrees Fahrenheit? Oh, I mean, man. 20 degrees I Celsius to Fahrenheit. Ask me this, and I am the worst. I think you, I don't know. I think you double it and then plus 30. Well, zero is freezing, right? So 20 has got to be pretty warm. <laughs> yeah, it's. I think twenty is like something like eighty degrees or something. 80? Oh, yeah. No. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> that sounds like nice on. weather. If you double it yeah, and add is... thirty, maybe about seventy-five. We're not meteorologists. This is a logistics <laughs> show. <laughs> I know, but we are supposed to know math, <laughs> anyways. So a big issue down here, though, has been the trucking capacity crisis. There's not enough drivers. There's not, there's not enough space on the trucks. Just this month, capacity's abated a little bit. That might have something to do with fewer shipments from China coming in. Not really sure. Too early to tell. In Canada, what's the truck driver situation going on up there? Is it a similar problem? I did a little bit, a little bit of research. I have spoken to a few people about this and actually a mutual friend of ours, which I will bring up in just a minute. But the Canadian Trucking Alliance has said by 2024, we're going to be short about 48,000 drivers. And the average age of our drivers in Canada is about 48. So that is going to make a huge impact, obviously, um, in North America, but Canada specifically. Part of the problem is, is that the lifestyle is a hard sell. I mean, you guys know as well as I do, um, I'm not talking just about Canada here. It's a hard sell, right? And most companies, especially in Canada, have more trucks than drivers. You know, it's not a very appealing lifestyle for young people. And the industry is having a really hard time attracting talent because they're just not sure how to do it. But for young people actually looking at it as a career path, they're looking at it and it costs, from what I read, it costs approximately $7,000 to become a driver. I believe that's in Canadian dollars. Um, So maybe about five grand American. I don't know if it's the same over there. But that's, I mean, when you look at that, it's, that's a pretty steep cost to be able to become a driver, right? Yeah, well, we're so desperate over here. I mean, you mentioned your average age of 48, which is getting up there, but we're in the 50s over here. And we're short in the hundreds of thousands of drivers. It's a situation that's getting, it's getting really bad. And the only thing that can really help it, at least at the moment, because tech like autonomous vehicles is still, you know, a little bit of a ways away. It's, it's not ready for prime time yet. Uh, but the, in terms of like the 7,000 for like the CDL, companies now, because they're so desperate, are paying for that for young people who want to join the field or actually just about anybody. You don't even have to be young. Are you willing to drive? <laughs> Here's your CDL. Here's a pair of keys and, and they'll pay the fee for you. That's a good point. But you bring up another good point about the autonomous vehicles. I had a discussion um, with Graham Robbins of Border Buddy. 
he's been on my show a few times and he's also the sponsor, but he was talking about the autonomous vehicles and the fact that they will still need drivers in the cab, whether it's driving itself or not. So we're still going to need drivers that know what they're doing, regardless of whether we go autonomous or not. You know, there's a couple of things that sort of bring hope, I believe, to this situation. One of them is Ellen Bois. Um, she runs the Woman in Trucking. And she says, you know, that diversity in this space is key. And she's doing some absolutely amazing things. I know she just got a show on Sirius XM radio, which is amazing. But she's also created a doll for girls to show them that truck driving is a career and is a good career to even aspire to. So she's doing and she's also spearheading changes in the industry as even as far as the rest stops being safe for women drivers. And so those are the types of things that I really think that are going to be key to helping the industry attract more drivers, more diversity in the driver space. Yeah, it's kind of amazing, but such an obvious solution in some ways is that women are so far in the periphery when it comes to truck drivers, you hardly even think about them or they're even mentioned in articles. However, you know, that's a big hiring pool that you could look at for, for women to be interested in getting behind the wheel, especially if they're willing to give them close to equal pay or even equal pay. Ooh, God perish the thought, right? But they give them equal pay because they're starting to pay like $80,000 to truckers now in the United States. Entry level. Absolutely. Yeah, well, you know, the other incentive, especially for women as well, is that you're on your own schedule, right? And so for not only women, but the next generation or the, the younger the younger people to take a look at it as a profession is that that is really appealing. Yeah, when Paul Charles was on here, he's a veteran trucker. He's been doing over the road for 13 to 15-ish years now. And we were getting into the recruitment problem that trucking has. And a lot of it has to do with cultural perception and the fact that there's really no media that's geared towards making trucking look cool. There's no Smokey and the Bandit like the 70s had. Now anyone who's grown up seeing truckers, you know, they're chasing teens around at truck stops or stalking women on the highways. They make it look like a very scary profession. Yeah, okay, you bring up a good point. But then I'm also going to say that there are alternatives to this. So you and I have a mutual friend named Pat. Oh, yes, Pat Roach. You know who I'm talking about. I do know Pat Roach. He was on my show. I'm not sure if he was on your show, but he was on my show, I believe, in season one. And we were talking about the use of inland waterways uh, to help mitigate the driver shortage as well, which I think is, it is a good alternative. You know, we need to make use of you know, the different avenues that we have available to us. And I think that that would be one way of doing it. Yeah, he has some interesting points there. The hard thing is just really getting some traction with the adoption, going back to that European model and, and using even the Great Lakes for a lot of coastal shipping. I know there's some laws like the Jones Act that stand in the way of it being viable in the U.S. in terms of shipbuilding. Although don't let me say that too loud in front of uh, <laughs> in front of Pat, because he is a hardcore evangelist of this intercoastal shipping. We will not send the episode to him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have anything against it. And I, would, I think it's a great idea if it were to happen. It's just I don't, we don't see a ton of people investing behind it yet. So it's hard to get overly excited. Yeah, but I also believe that it's also because of, you know, there's not enough out there about it. So it could be just ignorance and not really knowing how it can help with the situation, how it can benefit maybe the companies as well in the transportation space, maybe even to cut costs. Really, I think that at this point in the industry and in the community, I think people really need to start keeping an open mind about the ways that things have been done and the ways that we're going to move into the future. Well, it's it also takes like a Walmart, you know, whenever Walmart adopts blockchain or something like that, or does a pilot initiative. And actually lately, Walmart's been really good about being innovative with their supply chain. But if you have a giant BCO like Walmart come into play and they decide intercoastal shipping is viable, suddenly intercoastal shipping is viable. And I think that it's going to take that type of conversion from just a one or a few huge BCOs. But why do we have to wait for that? This is, this is what bugs me. Why do we have to wait for that to be able to create our own path and for us to take advantage of different alternatives to to the norm to benefit ourselves our customers our country our community our you know climate change all that kind of stuff you know why do we have to wait why can't we just do it 
Yeah, well, the infrastructure is not fully in place yet, but it would it would be nice to see because a lot of those older, smaller ports they've kind of they've been left in disarray, but they're still out there. They could reinvigorate certain communities by being you know like a freight subway system. Yeah, and you're creating jobs at the same time in communities that the jobs have been taken away a long time ago if if the ports weren't used. Well, covering trade as a podcaster, it affords you the unique opportunity to talk with people like Pat or from all areas of the supply chain. You even have a very successful Women in Supply Chain series. And Sarah, let me interrupt my thought here because I think you'll be proud of me. Three out of my last four guests, including you, have been women. And that will be four out of six in a couple of weeks when Michelle Cully comes on here. And it hasn't even been intentional. But what can I say? You ladies are taking over supply chain. Well, I wouldn't go that far. But it would. it's <laughs> great to hear that you are definitely, you know, diversifying your guests that are coming on the show. I, I love my show. I love doing it. And I am so honored to be able to have people that are enjoying what I'm putting out there and allowing me to do something that I'm very, very passionate about. And uh, the Woman in Supply Chain series, you know, it was something that just sort of came about um, at the beginning of this year. And I love it. I love connecting with other powerhouse women in supply chain. Um, I'm looking to actually diversify it internationally as well, because I have had a lot of women from North America on the show. And there's just so, so many. Last night, I was at a organization for women in international trade event. And the, the topics that we are covering, the just the sheer, you know, power that we're bringing to the community and, and the things that we are doing to even move diversity forward is amazing. And, you know, I'm, I'm finding that one episode a month isn't going to be enough. So I was talking to a couple of women last night about what else that I could do in the community to really highlight these leaders and talk about their different perspectives and their different viewpoints and what they've brought to the community and the industry. And I am booked until part 15, which is in February. So and I've got some more amazing women coming up on the show just in the next couple of months as well. So really, really exciting time. And um, thank you for bringing that up because it's, you know, it's a really, really great series. And, and I'm just glad people are liking it. But being a podcaster and covering trade, I mean, one thing I can say to you is that and I'm sure you probably agree, it is so much fun. There is so many great people in this industry that with so many different perspectives, so much value to bring. And again, I think that learning from each other is the key, you know, knowledge sharing. Let's figure this out together. No, not, you know, no one is an island. I like being able to bring new innovation to shippers because let's face it, shippers don't have a lot of time to talk to new companies, right? Cold calling is dead in this industry specifically. Yeah, although you, <laughs> I've been in a few places where they still have a they have a gong and a uh, <laughs> they still have a whole battery of people on telephones no. all day long. <laughs> but really, I mean, realistically, everybody is stretched, right? Especially the gong, Sarah. I'm not even kidding you. They have to hit a gong. They have to. They have to literally get up and whack a gong if they make a sale. And like, it's not like the gong show. They don't like pull them off stage. I think they all start like applauding you or something. I don't know. It sounded like something I'd have in a nightmare. You know? <laughs> in a nightmare. I'm sure you had nightmares for days on that one. <laughs> I did. I was just hearing gong, like echoing through my head. You know, our new president here. She's a woman. Oh, Jill Clifford. You should have her on sometime. She's a. Uh, She's a, she's a great lady, though, but like self-made. She's been with the company for years. All she has is a high school education. She learned everything that she knows now in, in the frying pan. That's awesome. And I love stories like that. I love it, love it. And you can learn so much from, like I said, everybody, right? So, I mean, shippers are pressed for time. They don't have a lot of time to, you know, take a look and see what's in the industry without having to pick up that phone and get committed to, you know, a meeting or, or different things like that. And I I also like to think that I'm asking the questions that they would want to have the answers for as well that will help them in moving forward and, and taking a look at different things in their supply chain. But 
There is so much great innovation, almost too much. <laughs> and it's, but I also find that the industry is very, very siloed still, which drives me crazy. Yeah, it definitely is, especially when we talk about things like data, you know, and where, where data doesn't really want walls that, that silos or departments want to put it in because there's so much use and so much leverage that can be done with it, especially with things like TMS systems. You know, one thing that has me excited, and before I forget, just to, just to mention it, is it wasn't even really a conscious decision to diversify at all. It just so happens that women or the women that I spoke to had happened to be the most exciting people that I wanted to speak to at the time. There was never a conscious decision about gender. And I think that five, 10 years ago, if I was running this show, there probably would have had to be more of a conscious decision. So I think that it's a great sign, especially in terms of key leadership, how many women have moved Absolutely. up in, no pun Absolutely. intended. Absolutely. And it should chain. be like that, right? Oh, absolutely. You guys, you guys need to crawl right, right to the top of the food chain in here. But, you know, you're seeing young people, too, and it's not just women. You're seeing young people. You're seeing people from other diverse backgrounds and other walks of life. It's making for a much more interesting thought pool. Well, listen, there the is so much around diversity. I am speaking at the Supply Chain Management of Ontario Conference in October alongside Lori from Ernst & Young about diversity. And... Our session is going to be extremely interactive. That's one thing about me when I do go and, and speak at some of these conferences is that I want it to be engaging. I want to start a conversation. And Lori and I are going to do that because we're going to be, you know, showing different biases. Most people don't even know that sub subconsciously they have a bias, you know, and how do you deal with that? So there's a lot of different conversations happening around diversity. And it's not just about women in supply chain. It's you know, it's about diversity in general and how to overcome biases and how to bring together a corporate culture around it. And I think that it is truly, truly exciting that the conversation is happening and people are becoming more aware. Yeah, and they seem to be a little bit more realistic conversations than just a bunch of buzzwords like introducing another gender will bring synergy to, you know, our business development meetings. There seems to be there seems to be a, a bit more genuineness yes, behind it. It's a and movement, movement, ladies. It's a movement. <laughs> <laughs> Have there been any common themes, though, among your guests, aside from gender? Like, in terms of excitement around technology or supply chain digitization or whatever topics? Well, are, are I try to about keep it very diverse <laughs> in topic. There's that word again. Because there's so much to talk about in supply chain. And I want to make sure that, at least on my show, that we're talking about all of the different things, right? I want to be able to relate from the student to the C-suite in various different ways, talking about various different things. So when I have Graham Robbins on the show, we talk about industry trends and sort of what's happening right now in the industry. So, you know, the trade war side, the autonomous vehicle side, we just did an episode on how to plan for a future that's so uncertain, which includes remote teams, because the next generation that's coming into supply chain, they're more concerned about work-life balance than they are about what's on their paycheck, which definitely creates an interesting perspective coming into supply chain, because that means remote teams, or part of that means remote teams. And there are a lot of people still in this industry that don't think that remote teams work, but they can work. And they will work. And that's what people are looking for in the future. You know, I, I like to have conversations like that. But then again, talking about the innovation side and what companies are out there that shippers could have access to depending on their needs and supply chain. That's really important for, for me as well. Um, but the technology side, you know, a lot of people are gravitating to the technology side and the technology episodes as well, because I think that there's so much out there. It's so competitive right now that it's hard to spend time on it to figure out where you should spend time on the technology, what companies that you should be looking at based on your needs, and what really is out there because you don't know what you don't know. And so you kind of have to open up and, and really understand you know, what really is blockchain? Everybody's talking about blockchain, but does anybody really know what it means? And what does it mean for my business? You know, what am I going to need to know? Or, you know, right now I need to focus on data. Well, why should I focus on data? Well, here's why you should focus on data. 
because data is going to be the first step into that future of technology for you and your company. I think the technology ones are, are, are very, very important, but I still go back to a common theme, which is everything is still siloed and there's not enough collaboration for my liking. That's one of the things that I'm going to be changing with ships. I won't get into details just yet, but you will find out. And I think shippers are having a hard time, like I said, getting to know what's out there to help their business. So, you know, two common themes there really is uh, technology is important. Everybody's still trying to wrap their head around it, trying to figure out what's out there and what's going to help their business. And, you know, things in the industry are still siloed right now. Yeah, I'm starting to wrap my head around blockchain and it only took me doing three podcast episodes and writing three or four different articles and talking to lead developers at IBM. But now actually, it's, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. It's pretty simple, but it also has quite a few flaws, at least on the transaction level, for making it be able to go mainstream. Like, for example, something like Ethereum, which is blockchain-based, can only do seven transactions per second. That's slower than dial-up. But I think, too, when people say blockchain, what they really mean is supply chain digitization. So they're probably looking more for something like a transportation management system that they could use now that makes sense to optimize their freight. But the innovation that you mentioned, which was people working remote in supply chain, I had Eric Johnson on. He's the senior editor of technology at the Journal of Commerce. I asked him, what do you think will be the next biggest piece of tech to come into supply chain that nobody's talking about? And now I can tell him that at least one person is because he said he wants there to be something like Slack as a standard in supply chain where communication is opened up both internally and remotely between departments in a more modern approach to business like every other business and like startups are doing the way they allow their employees yeah, to Yeah, absolutely. So I, and I asked him the same question. Isn't that funny? <laughs> Um, but in my, <laughs> in my episode with him, he was very much about data. You know, he said data is really something if, if companies aren't focusing on it right now, they need to be focusing on it. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that just kind of goes without saying. You know, supply chain with us, we always kind of have the echo effect here where a uh, new innovation or something comes along and then is, you know, it gets shouted out in the cave and eventually supply chain will, will echo it, it back or, completely ignore it. I mean, things like ERP took forever to get instituted and adoption on things like TMS is just painfully low. Like it, it absolutely makes no sense in this day and age to not have no, a absolutely TMS, but not. you don't and see I everyone using it. I think with the rate of it. change right now, again, going back to that mediocre comment, so. So you're starting ships. So what has you excited in the technology front in 2019? Aside from just, the, you know, the communication aspect with something like Slack, what do you think uh, a company like yours or at least the supply chain as a whole Launching will really ships, be able to take advantage of That's going to be happening in 2019. Forward? So I am very, very excited about that because that is going to be a mixture of an online, well, it's going to be a marketplace for shippers. And uh, I don't want to go into too much detail. I want to talk about it so bad, but <laughs> I don't want to go into too much detail, but I'm, uh, I'm so is it just sort of like a cargo matching, some sort of cargo yes. matching platform plus yeah. other things, yeah. right? Okay. <laughs> so we'll give them that much. It's a cargo matching. And we've talked about freight cargo matching and how that's an emerging technology. And I think 2019. Yeah, I think we will. I think we will. It's just a matter of, I, I think that, I think we need to listen to the shippers more. Yeah, well, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't because there's some shippers who do crazy things like just, you know, regardless of the market or anything, regardless of how much freight they have to leverage, they just sit around in the spot market all day when they should be leveraging things, you know, with data and with contracts. And there's other ones that should definitely be using the spot market or should definitely be looking at freight marketplaces. So I think that just in general, there needs to be more education about our business. And I think what we're going to see, Sarah, and we, we don't really see it right now because a lot of people from our generation and, and older generations kind of fell into supply chain, whereas now you're seeing a ton of colleges offer degrees in supply chain. So people are taking specific career trajectories to get in this Yeah, business, but I'm going to make a point on this because, makers. and I think that's great. You know, I think that it's great that they're looking at supply chain as a career path, but I also feel like the companies that are in the community, in the space, are talking about a talent shortage. When I really think that we need to be looking at it as a talent mismanagement. And I think that we need to be able to manage the talent that we have to really be able to embrace the talent that's coming. Does that make sense? 
No, yeah, absolutely it does. And that's understanding the the different workflow processes of people from different generations or different groups or even different educational and training backgrounds. People with a data focus you know, are going to have a different type of mindset than someone with a, an English literature focus yeah, or even a that, different though. type it's of science It's about making background. sure the right people are in the right roles. Um, I think everybody's sort of guilty of that in some way or another. And I really think that we need to get that right to be able to create new and different roles for that supply chain talent that's coming out of the schools that are coming out and looking at supply chain as a career path because roles are changing and people want to maximize their time at work. They want to be able to give to, you know, the companies that they're working for all of like the talents that they have. And so I think that we need to be a little bit more aware of that talent management. And just one more thing on the future of uh, supply chain. One company to really watch out for is Sweetbridge. So they were on my show a few episodes ago. They're a non-for-profit winning all sorts of awards in supply chain. And their take on the future of supply chain is amazing. They're talking about supply chain being liquid. And one of the little snippets that I will uh, mention to you, because I really think that you need to go and listen to it at letstalksupplychain.com, is that logistics providers are going to become merchant banks. Interesting. Well, they're talking about the the fact that products moving around the world are trillions of dollars in assets. And so essentially what's going to happen is instead of us moving necessarily product, we look at it as moving money. That makes sense. I mean, that's how we look at it here at a boarding company when we're looking at people's freight and transportation spends and what they do. That's exactly what we are, we are looking at because that's what it is, right? And there's so much asset within your supply chain that goes beyond what I think a lot of people think. And that's just that what you're paying is a rate to move a container. And it's 10% of the books and, and that and that's where it starts and where it ends. And that's why usually we're able to go into companies and uncover millions of dollars of savings because there's such a lack of oversight and such a lack of training. And then if, as we go back to the silos that you spoke of, finance departments, accounting departments, and shipping departments, even though they have things like accruals, Absolutely. aren't really communicating Absolutely. at the level. Well, I am, I'm going to be on a panel actually with Sweetbridge in October at the Footwear Distributors Retailers Association um, in Long Beach. And we're going to be talking about the future of logistics and supply chain. So they're going to be talking a little bit more about that liquid, that liquid supply chain. And uh, Irina Roska is on that panel as well. And she's going to be talking about some of the stuff that she's been working on. So I'm excited about that. In Long Beach. Where is that taking place? Yeah. Oh, wow. That would be nice. In October? (laughs) The LBC. I used to live out that way. I haven't been out in California for a while, but I went to college out there. So I'm very familiar with Southern California. I do miss it at times, but not now. I'm actually a fall person. So I'm very happy. Yeah, but you might be a fall person, but that doesn't mean you're a winter snow person. Yeah, no. Yeah. Once it gets, (laughs) once it's after, like literally the day after New Year's, like once it's January 2nd, it can go. It can all leave. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sarah, any any NAFTA predictions for us? What are you hearing on that end? Uh, Just because we hit China again and China hit us right back. NAFTA (laughs) hasn't been talked about for the past couple days. So I'm not really sure if anything. No, I honestly, I haven't really heard too, too much. Everybody's just sort of rooting for our guys going in there and, and making sure that we get a good, good part of the deal as well. I'm sure they want to make it fair for everybody. Um, But I just don't know with you know, what he's, what Trump is pushing in his agenda as far as NAFTA is concerned and with some of the things that we talked about earlier, where it's going to go. I think that there are some changes that do need to be made. Um, It just depends on where it falls. Yeah. Yeah, he's got to start by, he's got to stop picking on Trudeau, you know, someone has to tell him that's not, that's not the easiest way to get a deal done. (laughs) I know, I know. I'm not going to go into politics because, um, no, no, because I remember I mentioned Trudeau and I thought a lot of people liked Trudeau and I mentioned him to you and you didn't seem to be (laughs) as much of a fan as I think that the American perception is. Everybody thinks he's good looking. I mean, that's all I hear. I don't think they hear what comes out of his mouth. (laughs) That goes a long way in politics. Oh my gosh. There's more to it than his good looks. Okay. 
This was easier, though. This was easier a year ago in terms of talking politics because you really could move on, whereas now, just because of the nature of things and because these agreements are getting broken and fractured, you have to talk about Trump and you have to talk about Trudeau. And it's a little bit unfortunate, especially with Trump in the U.S. from our side, because he's so hot button, right? It's, it's such thin ice before you're going to trigger someone on one side or the other. They're going to get upset with you because of your politics or you weren't you know, you didn't say enough nice things or enough bad things about somebody. So it makes it makes trade a little bit more difficult. But as I talked to Eric from the JOC, it's great to also at the same time have trade be kind of mainstream. And now when we talk to other real people. Yeah, and how it affects their everyday lives, right? I, I, I know beforehand people would be like, well, huh? I don't know. And I'm like, well, it's how the shirt gets to the store. And they're yeah, like, yeah, but I think also it oh, would no, never mind. It would be nice to never be a fly mind. on the wall. You know, I don't think that anybody is really going to know what's going to happen until it happens. And to be a fly on the wall in some of those discussions and negotiations, I think would be a huge perspective. Not that that's going to happen. Some of that stuff, I would, uh, uh, in 2019, if I can wish for something in 2019, it would be maybe for that aspect of trade to be a little less mainstream. It's like anything, the more negative something is, the more coverage it gets from the media when positive things happen in our industry. It doesn't really get reported on because there, I guess there's just nothing to lead the news with. But at least on our end, because we do cover it. Absolutely. That's why we're here. That's why we love what we do, right? Yeah, and, and Sarah, how can my listeners connect with you if they need to add another podcast to their menu? Where well, hopefully they, they will want to. What are your contacts? The details? podcast is called Let's Talk Supply Chain, and it's wherever you would listen to a podcast. I mean, really, wherever you would listen to a podcast. Um, I have a website. It's letstalksupplychain.com. On Instagram, it's Let's Talk Supply Chain. Twitter, it's Let's Talk S Chain. And on LinkedIn, I have a Let's Talk Supply Chain group. And then I'm on LinkedIn as Sarah Barnes Humphrey, if you want to connect with me there. But one thing that I do want to mention is that every Wednesday, I put out a listener's uh, question. So if you have any questions on supply chain, send it to listener at letstalksupplychain.com. I also post it on um, all the social media channels as well. And I, I get I start some really great conversations about you know, different supply chain questions that people have. And again, that goes back to the knowledge sharing and, you know, learning from each other. That's really my motto and, and what I'm trying to do on the show. So thank you so, so much for, you know, having me and allowing me to let your listeners know about my show as well. Oh, no, thank you, Sarah. I'll have to I'll have to come, uh, I'll have to lend my voice to the Great White North next year. Absolutely, your, your yeah, so I am, you know, <laughs> I am, uh, all my release dates are taken for 2018. So I am looking at January, February now to start booking guests. Yeah, all right, all right that'd we'll be We'll make it a happy Valentine's Day. Yes. Wait, oh they have Valentine's goodness. Day in Canada, yes. right? Is you it the same day? day. Can I, I Canadian it's like, Valentine's it's like Day? you asking me if we get sports channels. <laughs> Yeah, but we get American sports channels. You do. You get TSN, okay. right? Like, I don't live in an igloo over here. Yeah, but they only they only play the Buffalo have, Bills. You have to watch Bills games here. exclusively. Like, I'm not cheating my way out of the front door every day. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I was doing so good with improving our Canadian relations. Then at the end, I just it's had to trip good. on myself. We're used to it. We even have the 24 hour. Sarah, though. <sighs> God, it's Dunkin' Donuts yeah, versus Timmy Yeah, we're invading America with our <laughs> Tim Hortons as well. Oh, man. Man, I don't know. You're going to have a tough time. We got Dunkin' Donuts here and Starbucks and even Mary Lou's on the <laughs> I, I don't know Donuts if there's any room though, for Timmy Hell. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. People here are uh, addicted, though. Can't Can't stop them. They cause accidents cutting across the... Cutting across no, the road they to get do in not. the Dunkin' Donuts driveway. It's scary. They do. People have a crisis here. It's, 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 well, uh, we have, there's an issue. We they have need therapy. Rows they need Dunkin' Therapy. We have rows of cars waiting to get into it, Tim Hortons. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's madness, but people get addicted to the, the coffee, and then everyone yep. does the drive through so then the line becomes just massive. <laughs> And that's what Ships is going to figure out. They're going to make the line smaller at We're Timmy Hoes. Coming to you in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> We're fixing the Timmy Ho's congestion. 
Well, all right, Sarah. Thank, thank you, you so much Tim. for joining us it on the show It has been a pleasure, today. and again, I'll have you on my show in the new year. Boxing Day is in December. Yeah, and happy early Boxing Day. It's Thanksgiving first. Thanksgiving I said early first, Boxing okay? Day. It's like me saying, all right. well, I guess I can say happy, right, happy Black Friday. Yes. Right, well, do you guys have Halloween? <laughs> it's usually very, very all right. cold, but we have all right. Halloween. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, happy <laughs> Halloween, Sarah. <laughs> All right. That was that was fun. Looking to modernize and future-proof your supply chain? Contact a trusted advisor at a Born and Company today for a complimentary consultation and learn how we have successfully negotiated over five billion dollars in client freight expenses. Just head on over to abornandco.com. For this episode and all of our previous shows, visit abornandco.com slash podcast or simply search for Consulting Logistics on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player of choice. If you have any questions, comments, requests, and guest bookings, email me at tdooner at abornandco.com. That's T-D-O-O-N-E-R at abornandco.com. For Sarah Barnes Humphrey, I'm Tim Dooner. Say, take care and happy shipping. Thank you.